Hi to everybody that's joining us today. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Emily Enns, who is a member in our department. Most of you will know her. And she's brought along some of her colleagues um, from the Cross Cultural Ecology Lab to share with you some of the amazing work that they're doing and to give us an introduction so that we can be more involved with other members in, at university. So I will hand over to Emily and Co. And thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Isra. Um, just a correction there that I have with my colleagues from Macquarie's Research Centre, Cache, here to give an introduction to Cache. We have the director, Bron Reneal, um, the outgoing director, the incoming director, Ronnie Power, Cache um, manager, Alice McClymont, and here in spirit, Karen Sawada. <laughs> But now I would like to hand over to Bronwyn, who will give you a brief intro to Keish before I talk to you more about our lab. Thank you. Can we have the first slide? I'm trying. <laughs> um, why, why, why? There we go. Okay, thanks. So Keish stands for Centre for Ancient Cultural Heritage and Environment. And uh, it came about, it, it was going to be called the uh, Centre for for ancient studies uh, or ancient heritage, but eventually we realised that there were amazing people in the uh, field of environmental and earth sciences who we wanted to collaborate with. So uh, this was really born um, out of good relationships between, working relationships between uh, a lot of people at Macquarie and also with external partners like, like ANSTO, the nuclear facility in uh, Lucian Heights. So um, I live in Canberra and uh, am shortly going to go and work at the ARC for two weeks. So that's why, uh, two years rather, so <laughs> in two weeks. So that's why Ronica's taking over as director. She was our deputy director, uh, as was Karen Sawada. Uh, she'll come on as deputy and Emily is our other Deputy. So uh, very happy to be here with you. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do for no more than five minutes and to welcome you to come along and collaborate with us if you see anything here that piques your interest. I'd also like to say I'm sorry there's no, uh, not more people from ancient history here. We're having our monthly departmental meeting right now. So uh, not many of them could come, but uh, Emily's seminar is going to be on YouTube. So hopefully they'll be watching it. Okay, if we could have the next slide. Um, it's just a few contact details, really. I've already introduced these people. Um, Alice is here today. Ronica is here today. Karen isn't. Karen is an arche paleoarchaeologist of ancient Egypt, and she is working on uh, dating of stuff in collaboration with Ansto and with Ronica and others in the department, uh, and very much open to collaborations with EES. So. Uh, that would be a good email to take down, as would um, Ronica's. And Alice is our go-to person. Welcome, Alice. She has just recently put together a huge uh, magazine called Cache Matters, which you'll find on our website, which is listed there. Uh, it's a very long uh, URL, but if you just Google Cache MQ, you'll find us. Uh, next slide. We have three themes uh, that we've been working on for, since we came into existence 18 months ago. The first is humans in their ancient urban and natural environments. So you can uh, see where Emily's work fits in there, but also the work of people like Ronica and um, Phil Duncan uh, from Wollonga Maru. So we're really keen to build those indigenous partnerships. And uh, we see that as a niche that Keish can feel bringing ancient history together with other ancient cultures which are not usually considered uh, in on the same page such as um, First Nations Australia. Our second group is working on receptions of ancient cultural heritage uh, which is really how we mediate uh, ancient knowledge to the public to broader audiences but also across disciplines uh, to others in disciplines like your own. And the third group's working on ancient models of leadership, learning from the past. This is my uh, little baby. Um, I've been looking mostly at Roman and Byzantine leadership and what they can tell us about things like crisis, 
uh, got an ARC at the moment on uh, crises of leadership in the Eastern Roman Empire from 250 to 1000 CE. So that's still in its infancy, this project. Uh, the ARC just started this year, um, but we're hoping to grow that with Indigenous participation as well. So thanks for having us along today. It will be really nice to meet you in person when we can do so. And I'll just hand over to Ronica to say a few words. Thank you so much, Bronwyn, for that wonderful introduction. And hello to everybody. Uh, I am coming to you live today from Ashfield uh, in the inner west of Sydney. And that is uh, the land of the Wongal people of the Eora Nation. And um, very important in this uh, virtual world that we're occupying now to remember that uh, we are uh, always on Indigenous land and um, I send my greetings and my greatest of respect to you all out there wherever you are and to the um, uh, First Peoples of uh, all over Australia and it's a it's a great touch point to actually uh, start from because really one of the prime objectives of Cache is to bring together every aspect that we possibly can of uh, the arts and the sciences to further our investigations and extend our understandings of, of knowledges of the deep past um, to be able to answer some questions, some tough questions that we're facing in the present and also that we will face in the future. And this is a natural partnership that we're talking about today, that we're reaching out to all of you um, across the Faculty of Science and Engineering um, to bring together that really strong sense of interdisciplinarity uh, that uh, many of us have already been enjoying for some time. Uh, we, I personally have got a lot of uh, existing relationships uh, across the Faculty of Science uh, and we also so in the Department of Ancient History have got some very great long-standing friendships uh, with people already in Cache, um, not to mention M, of course, in the first instance, but also our very dear friend Damien Gore, Tim Ralph and uh, Mariella Heberstein, um, who, all who have been a part of Cache since we started. But we are just really getting started and we're really, really hungry for more. And so what we're hoping to do today is to say hello, let you know that we're here, let you know that we're very, very interested to collaborate um, and to uh, extend the work that we're doing. Um, with a lot of colleagues in the Department of Ancient History are obviously focused in other parts of the world in their engagements with ancient cultures, but we're also very, very interested interested in honing our, um, our exploration into ancient Australia and uh, really, really keen to invite you all, get in touch and please do come and join the, the fun, the festivities. Our um, mission is to be able to support research and to uh, enable you to, to grow your projects and to grow our collabor collaborations. Because, uh, of course, in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, we really do believe that by working together, we will all achieve so much more. So if that sounds something like you're interested in, if you're interested in learning more about the ancient people, the ancient environments, built or natural, uh, or any aspect of ancient cultural heritage or societies, please do get in touch. You're very, very warmly welcomed. Can I, can I add one thing? We've got a current run, round of funding open. Uh, it's closing on the 6th of June. So if you want any amount of money up to about 5,000 for a project that's uh, relevant to one of these groups and it's got clear outcomes for publication and fostering ED, ECRs, um, please have a look at our website under um, funding opportunities. And we'd be really happy to read your, your proposal. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, team. And if anyone else would like further information or some questions about case, you might just leave it till the end of the presentation um, about our lab today. Now, let's move along to our cross-cultural ecology lab here in the Department of in Environmental Sciences, Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, this is us in isolation, all looking very gloomy and sad. Very sad, but soon we'll be back in the field. Woohoo! Yay! Um, so mostly what we do is um, field work. Um, we work in the area of cross-cultural ecology. 
Now you might be wondering, what is this thing cross-cultural ecology? Well, quite simply, it's where we bring knowledge systems and approaches from different cultures um, together to um, under better understand the environment. In our case, in our lab, we're bringing together Indigenous knowledge and Western scientific knowledge on a range of topics to enhance our understanding and management of the environment. So why cross-cultural ecology? What's our interest in it? Well, there are a few reasons which I'll run through briefly today. The first being um, that Indigenous land ownership and Indigenous land and sea management is increasingly being re-acknowledged in this wonderful country of ours. You, probably, you all should know the history of um, our lovely country, starting back in 1788. Well, prior to 1788, when all of, Aborig all of Australia was um, Aboriginal, occupied by our First Nations people, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, moving through to today, um, where we see about 30% of Australia's land surface area now being really legally recognised as um, Indigenous owned land through a, various, through, through a range of um, legislative um, acts, including the Native Title Act and Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory, for example. Um, another reason why we're concerned with and we're interested in cross-cultural ecology is for environmental and social justice reasons. Um, environmental justice, for those of you who don't understand, are not familiar with the, the term, um, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people with respect to the development, implementation, enforcement, environmental laws, regulations and policies. And we see environmental justice represented clearly in Australia's EPBC Act and across the world through um, other um, policies of the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations, for example. Um, here in Australia, you'll see this map over on the right. This map here um, represents Indigenous populations across Australia in purple and legally recognised Indigenous lands in orange and yellow. And you can see um, a disjunct sort of pattern here where a lot of Aboriginal people are living on the East Coast and along the coast in Central Australia, um, whereas a lot of the legally recognised Indigenous land um, is in Northern Australia and Central Australia. Um, so a lot of Aboriginal people are fighting to regain ownership of their land and control of their land um, right across this country. So our mission um, as cross-cultural ecologists is to work with Indigenous people across the land um, to increase recognition of their knowledge and ownership of land and working together to better um, manage different environmental issues. Um, one of the third, the third reason that we're concerned with cross-cultural ecology is the recognition that Western conservation approaches are failing to protect our environmental values. Perhaps the most um, obvious example is the decline in uh, mammal taxa across Australia. Uh, as you can see by this graph here, there's been a cumulative decline since uh, European colonisation in 1788. Um, and this uh, rate of extinction has been increasing and is continuing um, as we speak. Um, so we, alongside our Indigenous colleagues, would like to combine both knowledge systems to better understand what's going on um, with Australia's fauna and environment to try and better manage the environment. So you may all be familiar with the recent media around cultural burning and the right way fire that can be implemented to better protect and manage habitat for these species. So some of the principles um, of our lab, drawing on the, these um, urgent reasons for collaboration, um, our primary principle or tenet of operation is collaborative research. We want to work together respectfully um, in a wide ecology and environmental research projects um, that deliver mutual benefits, not just for science, but also for Indigenous people. We work with reciprocity, so there's reciprocal um, sharing um, of knowledge and approaches. We usually do place-based research. 
which allows us to bring in different disciplines to understand particular sort of place-based environmental issues. And we also would like our research to be transferable. So although we work in place-based contexts, we'd like other um, people and places to learn from what we're doing. So this usually um, means that we're quite heavily involved in outreach and sharing of knowledge through media, journal articles and so forth. So our business, what are we in the business of in the cross-cultural ecology lab? Well, our primary business is research. We run currently five different research areas um, through the lab. We also um, focus on developing new methods of cross-cultural monitoring. Um, and our third and not least role is for advocacy and education to improve awareness of cross-cultural approaches and Indigenous knowledge. So moving on to our research themes in the lab. Okay, we've got our five different themes that we're mainly working around. Um, the first theme is wetlands and feral ungulates in Ireland. land. This is where I started my research in 2008 when I was a postdoc um, at ANU. Um, back in 2008, I established some collaborations with four different ranger groups in Arnhem Land um, in the Northern Territory. And with these ranger groups, we uh, established some long-term wetland monitoring projects, um, many of which have continued up until recently, so for about a decade. Um, through this monitoring program, we use cross-cultural knowledge to understand um, the condition of the wetlands and the impacts that feral ungulates were having on the wetlands. Um, ungulates are hard-hooved animals and in Australia you should know that we don't have hard-hooved animals um, occurring naturally. All of these are introduced. So we're um, primarily concerned with buffalo, pig, um, horse and cattle in the Northern Territory. Um, so I don't really have time to go into a lot of the details on um, these research themes, but essentially we've been looking at changes in vegetation, water quality um, and soil using different techniques, including permanent photo points. So you can see over on the right there, um, a change in this floodplain at Jabal Bal near Manangrida in Northern Arnhem Land. Over a five year period, um, where these endemic palms have been declining on the floodplain due to feral buffalo. Um, moving along, we've also established some feral ungulate exclusion plots in some of these locations by request of the traditional owners um, who wanted to fence off some culturally significant billabongs to demonstrate the community um, the impact that feral ungulates are having. Feral ungulate management is a very complicated issue in this part of the country because they've got a range of different values. Um, from a Western scientific perspective, we might understand them as invasive species that need to be um, culled or removed. Um, however, up in remote Arnhem land, these animals are also seen as a food resource they have cultural significance and potential income for people. So management is not uh, that easy. So over the last 10 years, we've been monitoring change and communicating um, the impact to the community. Um, in 2016, we were um, lucky enough that Shana Russell joined our team. Shana Russell has just finished her PhD. Congratulations, Shana. Um, her PhD focused on um, the same sort of topics that I was working on prior, looking at the impacts of feral ungulates in wetlands. However, she, um, she took the human health impact approach where she's worked with the traditional owners from around Southeast Arnhem Land um, to understand um, whether feral ungulates were having human health impacts, as you can see on the right hand top photo. Um, through their use of freshwater billabongs, which Indigenous people of the area um, commonly use for fishing, um, fresh water, and a whole range of other benefits. Um, Shana just finished, she's published her few first few papers, um, including the detection of 
human pathogens, Cryptosporidium and Giardia in some of the uh, billabongs that are used by both humans and um, in ferals. Um, she's just done some media around this and hopefully some of this new information will lead into more informed decision making about management of the ferals. Um, yes, they might have potential um, income benefits for people in the future. However, the human health and cultural impacts uh, are really likely to outweigh um, those in the longer term. Um, so Shana's research, she's been working with the Nuka Yungbala Rangers in southeast Arnhem Land um, with the support of the Nature Conservancy, an international environmental NGO who have supported our work for many years now. And her work was recently promoted through their international blog site, uh, Cool Green Science. So check that out. There's the link. Um, further adding to our research in Arnhem Land, Daniel Sloan's been working in uh, the northeast with the Lanapo Indigenous Protected Area, looking at um, how these feral ungulates impact on vegetation and soil of the coastal floodplains. Daniel's been working very hard, as you can see, in very muddy conditions um, on a floodplain near a place called Gurumaru or Ninjia, where there's been widespread death of Melaleuca that you can see there in the photo on the left. Uh, with partners um, in northeast Arnhem and the Yuralka Rangers, Daniel set up um, some, uh, a large scale feral ungulate exclusion experiment. Um, across the floodplain where he'll be looking at changes in soil, salinity, um, and in trying to disentangle the impacts of sea level rise and ungulates on, on this system. Um, is some of his research has, has been uh, published and just recently submitted. Um, the recently submitted paper illustrated there on the right um, is where Daniel and the Uralka Rangers looked at some long-term plots the rangers had um, erected about 10 years ago and they were trying to draw lessons from those, those old flint fence plots where they found that um, there was it was an indication of um, increasing erosion from the feral buffalo on the floodplains. Now this is a, another new angle um, of the feral buffalo impacts. They haven't really their impact on soil erosion and um, influence on, I guess, natural levels of accretion hasn't really been studied before. So Daniel's been digging a bit deeper into uh, this question. His um, research has also recently been published in CSIRO's Double Helix Science magazine. Um, as stated before, we like to get the messages out there um, about the work that we're doing the collaborative cross-cultural ecology work um, and this was quite a unique um, outreach effort by Daniel having their work published in um, the science magazine for, for children. The second theme that our lab works on is biodiversity research. Um, we started doing this research in southeast Arnhem Land again with the Yugamangi Rangers and support of the Nature Conservancy and the Atlas of Living Australia, um, with Professor Craig Ritz from ANU. Um, now, the reason we started doing this research was following on from the initial feral ungulate and wetland research, um, where traditional owners of this area um, raised concerns about the decline of small mammals and also large goannas due to the invasion of cane toads and cats. However, because a lot of people from these areas have been largely restricted to the main communities of Nooka and Numbawa. They weren't really sure what was happening out beyond the community fence. So we made it our business to work with the, the rangers and community members to go out on country camping, um, looking for these animals and trying to um, collect data on species that occur in the area. So what you can see from this map here, this is downloaded directly from the Atlas of Living Australia website, um, where you can see the paucity of scientific data for the Southeast Darnham Land IPA compared to Kakadu National Park. So they're about the same size. Kakadu National Park, obviously, is a, a government-run national park of world heritage um, significance. 
uh, whereas the seal IPA is on Aboriginal land in Arnhem Land. Um, it's managed by very poorly resourced Aboriginal ranger groups. Um, so we've been working together to try and um, boost the data they can use to inform their management and generate further funding for their work. Um, here's some of the records that we've collected uh, with the rangers and have uploaded to the, IP, uh, to the ALA website. Um, this is also a capacity building opportunity for the rangers to engage with Australia's national database of species and see their own names on the map. Now this is to redress you know, many um, ills of the past um, where researchers have gone into Aboriginal land, taken knowledge um, and not acknowledged the traditional owners and the rightful owners of that knowledge. So we've been working hard to try and make sure that we do that through our research and promote that fact. Um, we've worked for many years now, seven years, time is marching on, um, working with hundreds of different traditional owners of the area, young people, um, to record species of the area. We've been taking tissue samples um, as well for later genetic analysis. Um, and through that process, you know, we've learned a lot about the biodiversity of the region and decline. Um, we've been not only collecting scientific data, but recording indigenous knowledge of species, their names, uses, cultural significance, in partnership with elders and youth. Um, these projects have informed land management of the region, for example, their fire management. Um, a little stories about this Leichhardt's grasshopper. You can see the pretty orange and blue coloured grasshopper there, which is a, um, a, a near threatened species in the Northern Territory, Leichhardt's grasshopper. It has um, quite strong cultural significance. We found that once on one of our surveys in a very remote part of Arnhem Land. And this was the only record in the Outlook of Living Australia outside of the Kakadu National Park or government run national parks. Um, the excitement of this find um, really reverberated across the community and has encouraged the rangers um, burning planning um, not to burn these areas where we found this grasshopper. Um, We've also found some new species, like this new Marithi species, the fire skink down there, the photo with the red tail, um, and developed some new data um, recording technology and apps that you can see all the young people love using, and then downloading data onto computers, again, um, the capacity building exercise for the community. Oh, um, yes, right, and for this we won the 2017 Eureka Prize for Innovation in Citizen Science, which is all very exciting. Um, for us, we've worked for a long time in the bush, sort of out of sight of many people. So to get the national recognition of the importance of this program, program is very exciting for us. Um, it's also led um, recently to a new stamp. I don't know if you've seen this pretty little stamp, um, but this, uh, our project was selected as one of four citizen science projects across Australia to um, be represented on the, the new release of Australia Post Citizen Science stamp. So look out for those in your post box. Um, over the last couple of years, on the back of the Eureka Prize, I suppose, um, we won a um, quite a handy little grant from the Australian Government Department of Industry, Innovation and Science through their Citizen Science Grant program. Um, this really allowed us to consolidate the work that we've been doing in Southeast and Northeast Arnhem Land, working with communities. Um, over the two years of that grant, which um, was 2017-18, was it? Um, we did 16 animal surveys across this vast area of Eastern Arnhem Land, which is 40,000 square kilometres. Um, 16 surveys with um, different school groups. We've recorded 2,637 um, individual animals that have been uploaded into the Outlook of Living Australia and involved 316 unique participants or 443 people in total over the duration over the two years. Um, this was a massive project, very exciting. Everybody loves going out camping, catching animals, looking for animals. Um, as always, we've deployed a cross-cultural 
research methodology where we've used Western science to trap um, animals and record them, as well as Indigenous knowledge. So whenever we've done the survey, we will always sit down with elders um, and learn from them um, different language names and knowledge in relation to the species. Um, this has been furthered by master's student Bridget Campbell, who will be submitting next week um, her amazing work mapping Indigenous knowledge of small mammal decline in northeast Arnhem Land. Last year, she sat down with traditional owners of um, the northeast for three months in very you know remote northern Australia by herself, recording knowledge from elders about six critical weight range small mammals. Um, all of those six small mammals that she chose are supposed to occur in this area, but they're very rarely seen these days due to invasive species and other threats like climate change and altered fire regimes. So Bridget's been working with traditional owners um, and school groups to raise awareness about the decline um, and to try and pinpoint where we might find these animals in future surveys. Um, this is very innovative work, um, which people talk about a lot, but very rarely actually do. So I'm very proud of, of Bridget's work here and look forward um, to submitting next week. Um, over the last few years, as I've sort of established myself here at Macquarie Uni in Sydney, we've tried to bring some of our cross-cultural approaches further south, um, lessons that I've learned for, you know, from a decade in the Northern Territory, try and bring those down um, and work with Indigenous groups from South Eastern Australia. Um, in particular, we've been working with groups in Northern New South Wales, the band by um, Banjalang, who work at Minyamai Indigenous Protected Area, and then the Jagoon Indigenous Protected Area. Um, we've similarly been doing cross-cultural biodiversity research and developing new apps with the rangers. Um, and in this instance, looking um, at the potential impacts of climate change. Um, so we've partnered with um, scientists over in biology through the New South Wales ADAPT program, where we've been um, working with Minimai IPA um, to record how climate change might be affecting their cultural heritage and biodiversity. Um, this has been a very um, yeah, rewarding experience for all involved and looking forward to more work with these guys. Um, through the process, we've developed a, um, a seasonal calendar based on Indigenous knowledge. Um, and this really captured um, the Banjalang culturally significant species and allowed us to um, illustrate how, how the, their knowledge, how they and where they expect species to be at certain times of the year. And then we predicted how that might change in future climate change scenarios. So if you would like further information on this research, you can look at the New South Wales Adapt website, which we've given the link here. Um, and you can see there's a little booklet calendar and a video that was made um, for the New South Wales government and Kataya Barrett, who's now a master's student in our lab, participated in this project as well. Um, the third theme that our research revolves around is cultural burning. Um, I've really actually tried to avoid getting into this space because there's so many people, so many scientists involved in it. Um, nevertheless, I guess through our place-based research, um, it's, it was, it's been brought to our attention that's something that we need to um, focus on. There's opportunities there um, to expand our work. Um, so in particular, Michelle McKemmy, He's a PhD student in our lab at based at UNE, has worked um, with Northern New South Wales groups, especially the Bambi, as well as the Yugamangi Rangers from Arnhem Land, um, to record Indigenous knowledge about cultural burning, traditional knowledge that can be um, deployed in contemporary land management settings. Again, they've drawn on the use of seasonal calendars as an instrument to form fire management using traditional knowledge. You can see a couple of Michelle's papers there. Uh, the fourth theme that we've recently been working on is Aboriginal rainforest tree dispersal. 
Um, I started doing some more work with Maurizio Rosetto over at the Botanic Gardens um, in Sydney. Maurizio is a plant geneticist who's interested in the biogeography of some rainforest trees and noticed disjunct populations. Um, we then started chatting about this over a beer one evening and I reached out to some of my Indigenous partners and invited them into a project where we look at combining Indigenous knowledge, genetics, linguistics and ecology to better understand um, the distribution of these disjunct populations of rainforest trees. Um, we, we published one paper in 2017 to sort of illustrate the concept and how we'd come together bringing the different knowledge systems to understand um, dispersal. And you can see some of our um, initial results here, um, which were around the black bean, so Castana, Sperm and Astral, some of you might know it. Um, but this black bean occurs along the coast of um, Eastern Australia. And we've looked at the populations up in the Cape and northern New South Wales and found quite um, close association between the two using um, genetic tools. So that's that middle map there. Um, and then working with traditional learners, we've tried to um, understand whether there may have been some dispersal, um, human mediated dispersal between these two regions you know, over the last thousand, few thousand years, um, for which we need to rely on Indigenous knowledge to, to tell us what happened. Um, we did, in one case, um, we came across a song line called the Nothingali song line, um, which is a story or a song um, which tells about um, some ancestors who walked from a place near Byron Bay across ridge tops, dropping with black bean as they went. So this um, song, um, you might think is, you know, just any relevant telling, you know, a little yarn around the fire, um, actually informs us about past dispersal of um, tree species, which we see um, in our extant vegetation patterns today. Um, and as this um, line of inquiry really has the potential to transform our understanding of um, current vegetation distributions in Australia and really forces us to, um, to really look at the way that we're modelling vegetation distribution and assuming that current populations simply rely on um, soil and climatic features to drive distribution, whereas this example clearly shows that humans, Aboriginal people thousands of years ago, deliberately moved plants and have deliberately um, influence the distribution of these species. Um, so there's a whole lot of research at the moment coming out about this. You might have read Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, which also talks about um, these ideas. Um, so this is a very exciting area of recent research for us. Um, we've got an ARC discovery, which we're working on at the moment. Patrick Cook and Monica Fay are two PhD students working on this project. Um, Patrick Cook is an Indigenous uh, PhD student. He's based in Cairns. Um, Monica is doing the genetics work. She's based at the Herbarium with Maurizio. And yeah, stay tuned for more info on this. And lastly, our um, fifth emerging research theme in the Cross-Cultural Ecology Lab um, is in the space of marine and coastal cultural heritage and, mapping, and mapping. Now we have two amazing master's students working on this at present, Kataya Barrett and Sabina Riznik-Steck. Um, Kataya is working in Gamay, Botany Bay with the Gamay Rangers uh, and interested in doing Indigenous marine spatial planning in that area. Whereas Sabina is working in Sydney Harbour with Darwell Elders, looking at how um, cultural heritage sites may be affected by sea level rise. So those are the five main themes that we work across in our lab. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we're also concerned with developing new cross-cultural monitoring methods. You've already heard me talk about some of those, um, where we've been developing not only the cross-cultural survey methodologies that combine Indigenous knowledge and Western science, but also developing new data collection apps um, to help us record these diverse um, knowledges 
We've trialled a few different pieces of software, CyberTracker, Fulcrum and FAMES, um, which is illustrated here. FAMES is a Macquarie Uni developed piece of software um, that I'm involved with with Sean Ross, who recently got another ARC grant to further develop that software, which is excellent. So, yeah, we've been, um, I guess, yeah, really lucky enough to be involved in some of these cool projects, developing new technologies, working with young people um, to really enhance Australia's understanding of different species distributions, but also for inclusive approaches to research and environmental management that, that we're very interested in. Um, the third thing that our lab does is advocacy and education. So advocacy, we, um, across Australia and internationally are advocating for increased recognition of Indigenous knowledge and cross-cultural approaches to research and land management. Um, so I've been doing that through the Ecological Society of Australia since 2010, where we've set up the Indigenous Working Group and annual symposia. Um, as a result of that, produced some reviews of documented Indigenous biocultural knowledge, um, highlighting where there's been um, a whole lot of activity recording Indigenous knowledge in Australia, but also where there's gaps or opportunities um, still for, for collaboration. So um, that's illustrated by the uh, map of Australia there in the top right hand corner. The dark areas is where we've seen a fair bit of documentation of Indigenous knowledge in the past and the white areas where there's uh, hasn't been much at all, so a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the graph below, which shows the cumulative frequency of these documented resources over time. So you've seen recently there's been a massive um, increase in interest in recording Indigenous knowledge since the 70s and 80s. Um, however, the dotted line shows that Indigenous authors have been rarely acknowledged and it's our mission to try and um, correct this, these mistakes of the past um, to support um, Indigenous researchers and Indigenous le um, led research as best we can. And I guess we're sort of, we're talking um, to those um, points at different levels, nationally and internationally, including through EFS, the IUCN and TURN, um, and have made several recommendations to EPBC Act reviews and the Australian Academy of Science policy, for example. And in terms of education, you may have heard about our awesome um, We Give a Bush Uni, which we set up in Arnhem Land. Um, I guess after you know a decade of or more of doing research in these remote parts of the country, talking with elders, sitting down, having cups of tea, talking about you know how we can make the world a better place. Um, I'm I guess constantly listening to messages from elders, um, lamenting the fact that they're you know young people, they aren't they're not receiving the education that they would like them to, that they don't have opportunities to go to university. So over the last few years, we've really worked hard to um, address their concerns. Um, we were lucky enough uh, a couple of years ago to receive two and a half million dollars from the Australian Government Department of Education to set up the We Give a Bush Uni, um, which is modelling cross-cultural education in remote Australia um, and creating pathways for remote students to um, access tertiary education, for example, here at Macquarie Uni. Thank you to all of um, my students, PhD students, master's students, collaborators out in Ireland and New South Wales. Um, we really are a team um, working together to, to change some of these situations and address sort of environmental and social justice issues in Australia. So I guess I'll open up now for any questions. Thank you very much, Emily. That was a really amazing and interesting talk and um, such a wealth of knowledge. Is there a means of kind of getting some Indigenous peoples involved with research without necessarily going down formal research routes? So I know a lot of the way young researchers get involved is by having done that master's, done the PhD, and then they get formally involved with the research group. What is it that you're trying to hoping to do to involve people who don't have that formal background? I guess we do that all the time. Um, they don't have formal research training, but everybody is good at something, everybody has knowledge to share. 
especially when it comes to Indigenous knowledge, elders that I've worked with always talk about the university of the bush. Like the bush is the is their university. They've learned from being out on country, talking to the elders. There's a wealth of knowledge there that mainstream Australia needs to take note of and respect. What are you going to do with Keish? Well, I guess as part of Keish, I'd like to encourage uh, my colleagues from the department to get involved in some cross-faculty collaborations with ancient historians. I guess bringing together the environmental and social sciences to better understand um, knowledge of the past, to bring it into the future so we can, you know, uh, make better decisions about um, our environment and society. And are you ever able to include any of your undergraduates in this research, such as bringing them into the field? Yes. Yeah, I've taken quite a few undergraduate students. To date, really, I guess the remote field work doesn't really allow for large groups coming out, but I've taken a few individuals out on specific projects through PACE units. Um, and they've greatly benefited from, from being in that very, very different, environment and, and learned heaps. So Bridget was a student who came out um, on one of the PACE units and she's continued her research out there over the years, which has been amazing. Another student who came out, Julia Salt, she came to North East Arnhem Land and did some work on the cross-cultural biodiversity surveys. She's now a coordinator of one of the ranger groups in Central Arnhem Land, doing some amazing work. So yeah, there's more individuals at this point until we can create some opportunities for large groups, I suppose. In regards to the work um, of Bridget and the mapping of these small mammals, can you briefly explain how her results can be used to inform further mapping? She's been um, trying to bring Western science together. So existing records of the species, so for example, the bandicoot, that was the map that I showed there, bringing together the Western scientific observations with the indigenous knowledge um, and bringing like over just separate layers of information to try and target areas for surveys. For further mapping, not too sure about that, but we're looking at um, yeah, just really further field work to try and find these animals. Um, we'd like to take some more genetic samples to do, look at some um, landscape connectivity questions um, to try and inform conservation really of these species. Your research clearly involves a lot of travel and work away from cities. How do you cover the cost of this and the workload, workload associated with HDR supervision when students are on site for such long periods of time? <laughs> yeah, I work during my sleep. Um, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, it does cost a lot of money to work in remote situations. Um, also, we work with a lot of Aboriginal collaborators who we pay as well. So I guess we've been pretty successful getting a lot of grants over the years to supplement all of that research. Yeah, bringing the students out, supporting them when they're first coming out into the field. And I guess I'm fairly selective with the, the students that I've selected, those that I think that, that, that can handle the remote situation, working in a cross-cultural collaborative context takes some particular um, personalities, I guess, to be able to successfully do that. Since there were very many nations and peoples, to what extent do you think there is a bias in recording Indigenous knowledge from the north um, as against the southeast of Australia, where much of the population now live? Yeah, there's massive bias in the records. Um, I sort of, yeah, I guess I've glossed over that part as well. There's very much a bias. Um, toward populated areas and that's where people are recording species and this in turn influences our understanding of threatened species, of current distribution and also where funding goes for those things. But that's why a lot of funding, you know, it's been going towards places like Kakadu National Park where they can clearly demonstrate that there's been a decline, um, say in quolls or whatever. Um, but Arnhem Land, where people haven't seen quolls for a long time, they've got no chance of getting funding for quolls, right? So this has been our, I guess, our aim is to go out to these places, work with people to try and um, remedy this situation and collect data to fill those data gaps. Yeah, so we see it as an opportunity, I guess, for collaboration and for Aboriginal involvement in Australia's conservation agenda. The Australian government is not going to give <laughs> Sydney back to the Aura Nation, right? Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess they, they're balancing the different um, competing interests 
and to date most of the land that's sort of, you know on the margins or crown land of, um, in the desert <laughs> um, has been handed back to traditional owners and yeah so people in more populated areas have much more of a, a fight on their hands Thank you again, Emily, for a really insightful talk. And I hope members of our department will reach out and collaborate with you. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a lovely weekend. We're back next week with um, Tara Jokic, who was actually a student here a couple of years ago. So definitely come along and have a listen to what she's been up to since then. So thank you very much, everyone. See you next week.